your glorious presence, Lord. And we just feel every time we gather, it's like a divine appointment in these days. We know that you're here in advance. You're here with us. You're here after we go. You're in the car on the way home. You're at home when we get there. You're at work before we get up. You're, you're everywhere, Lord. You're, you're just surrounding us all the time. And we love the walk with your spirit. We love being led by your Holy Spirit. We love the fellowship, the relationship that we have with you. We love the the, the intimacy and the purity of heart that comes from walking in your word and walking in your presence. And oh Lord, we just give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory and majesty. We lift you up. We lift you up. We lift you up in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, you may be seated. Thank you, team. Awesome. Appreciate that. Probably down a little bit front of house and maybe up a little bit. Um, on stage. That's good. We'll get there. Let me see what I, on the back of one of these sheets, I wrote down a whole lot of stuff. If I can find what I wrote down. It's quite exciting the way that God actually um, speaks to us about things. I, I um, just love the way that the Lord the Lord sort of interrupts our lives and communicates. And if I find the, where I wrote down some things on the back of my pieces of paper here, there it is, I found it. Um, driving to church on Sunday morning, Nancy had come in early for the prayer meeting and um, I was mucking around a bit and I'm driving in and um, driving down um, QE2 Drive and that and I'm looking at the cattle in the fields and um, just sort of nosing along, thinking, oh, they're looking healthy. And, and then I, I just felt the Lord just spoke to me, and he said, oh, I've, this, this is, I'll just relay how I, how I felt it was communicated, and almost like the Lord said, oh, they haven't really got a care in the world. They're out there eating their grass. Uh, you know what I mean? They, they don't um, communicate with God like humans do. Um, you know, the cows are always going to be cows. They're not going to be changed into goats at any time. <laughs> Um, thing. Um, you know, the Bible, they're a clean animal. The Bible says they're a clean animal. They were part of the sacrificial service for God. All this stuff's just bombarding in my mind. I'm talking to someone, oh yeah, that's really good. And, and then um, it's kind of interesting. And the Lord sort of me said, no, they don't change. So oh, that's good. And then, he, and then the, the word came up, just, he just said pre-existent truth. Um, the <coughs> you're, what you're gonna, what you got to understand is um, you know that when you come here and I'm teaching and I went to not, I'm not teaching baby food. I'm not talking to you about, you know, things that are entry level things in the in the realm of the spirit and God. I try to teach and train you as if you're all leaders in the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. When I get together with apostolic friends and prophets and that in the nation, senior ministries throughout the nation and that, the things I talk about with you here are the things we talk about there. Um, we, we, we're usually talking about um, theology and understanding the Word of God and how God's moving in the nations and stuff like that. So the Lord talked to me, he just said about pre-existent truth and I think the reason it was catapulted because I had listened to, um, I'd listened to a, a speaker, Nat, uh, uh, Kelly had actually sent me a thing of this guy that was speaking on Leviticus and I'd listened to him and it was it was really good. It was, uh, the guy was really, really good. I really, really enjoyed it. And he was going along and he got to one point and then he made a statement and he says, the statement he made with this, Leviticus, Leviticus 11 has to coincide and link with Acts chapter 10 um, concerning food, Old Testament and New Testament. As soon as he said it, something in my spirit just went, um, you know what I mean? I just like to that point, everything is I just going along. Everything he was saying was brilliant. I thought, mate, this guy's got it, you know. And I'm going along, going along, listening. And all of a sudden, he goes, Aah. and um, so if you know Acts chapter 10, it's where the sheet is dropped out of the heavens. I'll read some of that scripture to you, but um, because it's quite and it's quite important that we you know, link things together. See, I want you to understand. You know, the reason I share these sorts of things because. Um, Every one of us is different, and God will communicate by His Holy Spirit to us in different ways. And I'm absolutely convinced that uh, revelation is preeminent over information. 
And I'm absolutely convinced that all the way through the Bible, what you see is God coming to his people with revelation. And then from the revelation comes understanding or information comes out of that. And if we try to pursue God through information, um, uh, it's, it's a funny thing, but often it will block the revelation. It's almost like our natural man wants information, our spiritual man wants revelation. Revelation, um, the information will satisfy or, or help you to understand the revelation, but it, it comes, I believe, revelation first. And, um, and so God will speak to you in different ways, and you need to be open to how the Spirit of God is going to speak to you and lead you, because we're pushing in to a Spirit-led life. We're pushing into a Christianity whereby you're led by the Holy Ghost, where, where um, you're under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You're, you're operating under the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and it's a Holy Spirit walk with the Lord where you're led by the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit, spirit-led spirit journey. And um, what we're actually doing in this is we're teaching this thing. We're moving our dependence off men. We're moving our dependence off people. Um, we're, we're not making anybody famous on the earth. I've, I've been thinking a bit about that because um, just about every denomination has made somebody famous. So the reform theologians made Luther famous. The Calvinist Baptist Church movement, all of that, they made Calvin famous. The holiness movement, I came out of a Nazarene church holiness movement. It was John Wesley who was famous. The Four Square Church made Amy Semple McPherson famous. And, and what you do is you go along and you see all of these movements of God and all these denominational churches and then, you know, you'll have Spurgeon who's made, you, they all, everybody has someone. And it's really, really interesting because um, <clears throat> for me, this, this is where my heart is, um, I think that there's only one famous person on the face of the earth and that's Jesus Christ. <laughs> And, and if we're going to, if someone at the end of our life and our service to the Lord Jesus Christ, if the people are still focused on us and we haven't somehow or other in the way that we live, the way that we spoke, the things that were our values, we haven't directed people to a passionate love with the Lord Jesus Christ and he's not the one, number one identity in their life and the one that they declare as a hero in their life, we miss the mark somewhere along the way. And I know it's often that it's other people that exalt people. It's often not the people themselves that exalt themselves. Um, but still, um, you know, if you want to honor me in the ministry, then love Jesus Christ. You know, don't race all around the city talking about Murray Watkinson because you'll be horribly disappointed. But rush all around the city talking about Jesus Christ and being led of the Holy Spirit. And see, what the Lord's trying to reveal to us is this organic Christianity where our faith in Jesus Christ is led by the Spirit and we just uh, naturally ex explode, I suppose, into Christian service. And like I, I heard, you know, with that movie, um, uh, you know, the 70s hippie movie that was that, what was it called? Yeah, that was the one. Um, some of our guys went to that and at the end of the movie, they just jumped up in the middle of the picture theatre and said, everybody needs the Lord. You know, if you want to pray and receive the Lord, uh, you know, we're here and we'd be happy to pray for you. See, that's organic Christianity. I saw a testimony on the 412 testimony, somebody at work sharing that they're a born-again Christian and praying for people in their workplace. And, and see, that's organic Christianity. The, um, I'm still waiting for the photos from the baptism on Sunday afternoon where a group of our guys went down and took over the Linwood um, pools and had a baptism service. You know, I believe that there were other people in there just from the community coming in and our guys are worshipping and baptising people and preaching the gospel. It's bold, bold, um, organic Christianity. Just, just that's it. That's the life of the Spirit. Um, and and that's, the, that's the sort of Christianity I believe that God wants us to be living. That's the, how would you put it, the cutting edge. That's the exciting, you know, where Holy Ghost, what's going to happen next. That's, that's and it, it's not, it's not organized by the church or administrated by the church. It's not some big program that we're running or anything like that. It's just the Spirit of God moving in the hearts of the people, initiating ministry opportunities according to His plans and His purposes. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's being led by the Spirit of the Lord. So anyway, the cows, back to the cows. And 
coming along. And so this guy, anyway, so he said, now Leviticus 11 connects up with Acts chapter 10. I was going to read from Acts chapter 10. <clears throat> See, I haven't lost my way. I'm absolutely coherent. Um, this, is, this is awesome too. See, I just love this. So this is, this is um, uh, Acts 10, 9. The next day, as they went on their journey, they drew near the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and he wanted to eat. Now I relate to that because I'm in that state all of the time. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. See, when you when you look at if you if you see, I keep saying to you something you might pick up. I keep saying when you read the Bible, read it carefully, read it carefully because it's really important. So here he is, he's on a journey, goes to a city, goes up on the housetop to pray, he gets hungry, people are going to make him some lunch, going to make him a meal, and while he's up there, I think he falls into a trance. So he has this supernatural, spiritual experience in between prayer, hungry, and dinner. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he, and he falls into a trance. I love that, because that's, see, this is how the, this is how the spirit... See, what we've got to understand, the, the revelation in days today is spirit and word. See, you've got the word churches that are just word, 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 and they usually sneer at the Holy Spirit. They, they, um, it's quite interesting because you pick their attitude up where they, they say things like uh, worship is emotional, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, because God's an emotional God. I mean, God gets angry, gets sad, he's happy, he's blessed. And, and when you're in contact with God in theos, means to be enthusiasm, in theos means to be in God. God is an emotional God. But anyway, here he is, here he is, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound in four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And uh, a voice came to him, Peter, rise up, kill and eat. And that's in, that's, uh, in red in my Bible, so it's the Lord speaking. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again a second time and said, what God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. And this was done three times, and the object was taken up into the heaven again. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant. See, this is, this is, this is how the Holy Spirit talks and communicates to us so he brings a revelation to us and something might happen it might be a vision it might be a dream it might be just God speaking to you during the day something comes in and then you kind of get into the state oh, I wonder what that means uh, and that, this is beautiful he says that he wondered within himself what this vision which he'd seen meant and then it says this straight away behold men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose name was Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, so this is the revelation, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had sent them to him from Cornelius. He said, I am the one whom you seek. Well, what it was, was the message in this thing, this whole message here was, Cornelius, of course, was a Gentile. Um, Peter was called to preach the gospel to the Jews. You know that the New Testament, the New Covenant, was God's covenant with Israel, don't you? You know that when Jesus came on the earth, uh, when he started ministering, first of all, he said, first of all, we go to the Jews. We minister to the Jews. Even though the prophetic intention of the new covenant was always inclusive. In fact, if you understand, if you understand the work of God right from the book of Genesis all the way through, it was always inclusive. There were always the ones who came into relationship with the Jews, whether it was like the Ruth or a Rahab or whether it was a servant in the household of the Jewish people, if they aligned themselves through faith and the one true God, they were included as part of Israel. And it actually says in the scripture over and over again, they had the land rights and all of the inheritance rights of the Israelis through faith, through coming in under Christ. So the, the gospel has always been inclusive. It's always been, a, um, um, and, the, and the covenants, it's always had this inclusive aspect to it. 
So anyway, so what this, this is really, really interesting because the guy said, so he's gone from cl unclean and unclean foods and all of that sort of stuff in Leviticus and he jumps over here and he says, God showed Peter that because Peter can eat everything. And that's why my spirit just went, because that's not what that scripture's about. Now, the cattle, you want to know about the cows? God spoke to me about the cows. Okay. And how, you know, they don't have any moral standard. They don't have freedom of choice or volition like humanity does or anything like that. They're just locked into what they are. They don't, they don't change. So the Gentile, like us, who is unclean, we can change. We can, through faith in Jesus Christ, become clean. But the cow who's been created as a clean animal doesn't change into an unclean animal. <laughs> you may not be getting this, but the thing about it is, see, there are, there are some things, see, humanity, has, the, the wonderful thing about God's working with humanity is because of how he created us in his image, we have this ability, even though that we've been bound in sin and opposition to God, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work, our life can be totally changed and we can go from unclean to clean. But I don't believe the fixed things go from unclean to clean. I don't think a cow goes from clean to unclean. And I don't think the list of the unclean things that God listed somehow or other suddenly become clean. I don't think, they, I don't think the unclean things that God spoke about all through the Word of God are ever going to be an acceptable offering to the Lord. So you think, well, what, what is this? Well, you're on about food again. You know, I'm getting mad with that. And uh, that's all right. You'll either get mad, glad, or sad. But what you've got you to understand, now last week, uh, Wednesday and Sunday, I spoke to you about um, how God through faith made everyone he entered into covenant with righteous before the covenant. And I, I show you, I shared from the scriptures, I went through the scriptures on that. <clears throat> That's because God, can't, you see, what you've got to understand about our word in that is there's, there's the revelation of God that runs from the beginning all the way to the end and they don't change. God does not go into covenant with Satan. God won't enter into covenant with that which is unclean. God doesn't go into covenant with sin. He can't. His nature, it's just forbidden in his nature. It's just an impossibility. So to have covenant with man, you know what has to happen? Man has to become righteous for God to be able to make a covenant with us. And all the way through the Bible from Abraham and that, and I'll, I'll, read, I'll read these scriptures to you, you'll see that, you'll see this um, concept, um, Genesis 15, 6, and it says this, and he, Abraham, believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now I'll, I'll, I'll jump on, Genesis 17, 1 and 2. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Isn't that interesting? So this is, the, this is now, this is the conditions of the covenant. The covenant was made with a righteous man through faith and through that righteousness, now, that, now we come in, he says, walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. So he had to be righteous to receive the covenant. And then once he receives the covenant, the conditions of the covenant come in. Genesis 18, 19. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Genesis 22, 18. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Genesis 26, 4 and 5. I will give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. What laws are these? What are, what are you talking about laws before Moses? See, um, that's, <coughs> that's what the Lord was talking to me about the cow. He said this the pre-existent truth, or sometimes in the Bible they talk about the, the revelation of first mention. The, law, the laws, Abraham already had the laws before Moses came along with his bunch of laws. 
you know, God spoke through Moses, the Lord. I'm not, I'm not decrying those because I think, I actually think that they need to be lifted up um, into a position in the life of the church that the Gentile church hasn't even recognised yet and that we need to start recognising it. But one of the things the Lord is uh, studying, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at some of those things from um, Rabbi Schneider, and um, those seven things from Rabbi Schneider, it's really talking about um, the different aspects and view of Judaism and Christianity and the opposition that comes between them and understanding some of those. Some of the other stuff that guy preaches on, oh, personally, I certainly wouldn't agree with. But that's all right, because you don't agree with everything I say. See, it's not about that. It's, it's about <laughs> there's liberty under the Holy Spirit for the Spirit of God to lead us and to give us revelation of the things. We may not all carry the same revelation, um, and, and that's okay. There's, there's room for that. Where there's not room is for closed-mindedness and criticism. There, there's room for open-mindedness and for people to be able to walk in the revelation of God as they understand it. So here you've got Gentiles and Jews. The Jews, right, were saturated by what? The law. They were living out the law. You read, it's, it's interesting um, because I was reading in Galatians again this week and I just, I, what I like to do, sometimes I like to read the whole book and I read it over and over and over and over and um, because I'm wanting the spirit of the book and so I'm reading um, Galatians over and over and over and because it starts off and he says something like this, he says, oh foolish Galatians, who has basically deceived you you started off in the things of the spirit and now you've so quickly turned back to the things of the law but you know that the issue you know the issue that Paul is actually addressing with the Galatians if you go and have a read of it yourself over and over again he talks about circumcision well circumcision didn't have anything to do with Moses except for the all of the Jews after the time of Abraham who were in covenant and sons of Abraham would have been circumcised as part of the ongoing honoring of the covenant that God made with Abraham but now we're talking to the Galatians about the law and the major theme that he's attacking is some of these legalistic Jews were now requiring the Gentiles to be circumcised to be made righteous with God so he hits the circumcision over and over again through the book he's hitting away at that see if you don't understand the book you know from Genesis to Revelation if you don't understand the book you're going to miss a lot of what God's actually trying to say to us as the body of Christ so he goes on and he and he's addressing that issue of circumcision and he's he's saying to the uh, to the thing so to the um to the Judea you know and and then all of all of also you've got the you haven't got just the Judaism you've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the corrupt ones that were bringing in their own tradition their own laws over and above God's laws there's all this muck going on over this side you've got all the Gentiles who are lawless the Gentiles are lawless totally lawless we're not trying to follow the Ten Commandments or anything like that we're law we're coming to the gospel lawless they're coming to the gospel with the law we, we're both merging to the same gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, this covenant, this new covenant of God from two totally different perspectives. See, they rejected the Messiah. They didn't recognize the Messiah coming. They rejected Messiah and, and, and that, but we rejected them. They rejected him because of the law. We rejected him because we were lawless. We both came and rejected, we both rejected the Messiah. And then, it's as God opens up the eyes of the Jew and the Gentile that we both can come through Jesus Christ into that relationship with God and be made righteous, be made righteous through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's just, there's just no other way, only through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you've got to understand that we come, we have the same amount of human history as the Jews do. You know, if they've got... If we're up to day six or day seven, I don't know if that's 6,000 years of human history for the Jew, there's 6,000 years of human history for the Gentile. But we've got 6,000 years of lawlessness and they've got 6,000 years of the Torah, of the law. So when they, when, see, when what happens is we don't understand each other, we don't certainly understand our backgrounds. Now the thing about it is what you could understand is God made covenants with the Jews all the way through. So the revelation of the one true God was made to the Jews and then the covenants are made with the Jews right through even to the new covenants made with the Jews. Romans chapter 11, it talks about how we the Gentiles are grafted in. We're not the root, 
but we're grafted in as branches, so we receive the benefits of, of the root, the revelation that God has given and carried through the Jewish people and the seed of David who becomes Jesus Christ as the root. We get, we get grafted in. We're grafted in, you might say, to a revelation and all the covenants that were made with the Jewish people. And we come in and, and we, get, we get grafted into that. So <clears throat> the reason that I wanted you to see um, what the rabbi was talking about, because I want, I want you to understand how the covenant, when a new covenant came in that didn't necessarily delete everything of the old covenant, it just added on. It was just a continuation. It was, you know, so um, uh, he said to Adam and Eve, go forth, multiply, have dominion over the earth. Mankind started living, you know, sin had already entered in. The heart of man was desperately wicked. Um, we got so wicked on the face of the earth that God just couldn't cope with the wickedness anymore. So he decides he's going to judge the earth and um, he's going to flood the earth and he's going to destroy everybody except who? Except for Noah, the righteous one. <clears throat> so he chooses Noah out, goes into um, Noah through faith in God, believing what God said is made righteous. Then God enters into a covenant with Noah. What's the covenant? What does God say? What's the covenant conditions of Noah? He, he reiterates what he said in Genesis. He says to Noah, go forth, multiply. That's what he said. That's, he goes back to that original thing. Go forth, multiply. He talks about respect for animals, uh, uh, thing and that. He reiterates. Then we come up, wickedness comes in again, and we get up to Abraham. And um, then through faith, Abraham is made righteous and believing God. And... Um, and what's the big thing in the story of Abraham? The big thing, the big story about Abraham is he goes up the mountain with Isaac to offer him up as a sacrifice to God. That's his faith is so strong. He's going up there with his son. His son's carrying the wood. He's going to offer him as a sacrifice on the altar, a burnt offering on the altar. The son's carrying the sticks. He says, Dad, where's the sacrifice? You know, hello, the son, you know. It's probably, if he, was, if he was in tune with the spirit, there would have been something in his heart going, da 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 something. We've got the wood, we've got the knife, we've got everything, we're going up the hill, we've got to sacrifice. You know what I mean? There must have been some form of fire because it's going to be a burned offering, but there's no, there's no sacrifice. And what's going to go? Then he's putting the wood on the altar, and then he's got his son climbing up on top of the wood on the altar. And by that time, the penny must have been dropping for Isaac that he was the sacrifice. Um, but again, again, you see um, uh, the thread, the, the glorious revelation of God um, as Isaac was going to offer up his only son of the promise. One day, the son of God, the only son of God was going to be offered up as a, as, a, as a sacrifice. See, it all, it doesn't make sense. If you just come in from a lawless Gentile perspective and all you want to do is read the New Testament and start from there, the rest, it doesn't make sense. But when you go back into the old and you begin to see how God moves all the way through. And so now, okay, where, where, was, um, where was the sacrifices? Did the, the, the sacrificial priesthood come in through Moses? Well, then why was Cain and Abel offering sacrifice? Why were they offering offerings to the Lord? Why did, why did Cain offer an unacceptable offering of grain? And Abel, what did he do? He brought the, the young, the first of his herd and offered the sacrifice. See, it was already in, see, pre-existent truth. Pre-existent truth was already in place. The truth was already in place. The inclusiveness of God was already in place. The covenant, it's already in place. It's already set up in God. There's, there's no, and, like, and <laughs> I was going to say, there's no surprises in God. We do get surprised, but if you understand it, there's not many surprises when you understand the journey that God comes through. He gets, to, he gets to Moses, and of course by this time, you've had the people living in Egypt for 450 years, so they were, they were heathenistic, they were, they'd been living under, under control and under bondage and everything like that, so God brings the law in through Moses. God speaks to Moses, it's God's law speaking to Moses, and he, he lays it out. Um, actually in, that, in, that, um, in the, um, uh, the message thing that Kelly had sent through that I listened, that I really, really enjoyed, he said something that really just stuck in my mind. It interested me. And he said, during the plague in Europe, the time of the plague in Europe, they actually, um, anti-Semitism went, went nuts. They hated the Jews. They went nuts. Because what actually happened is the Jews were there. The plague was going on, but the Jews were not dying of the plague. And the 
the people at the time thought that the Jews, you go back into history, they thought the Jews had poisoned the wells and the water and that they were responsible for the plague and that the Jews were basically killing off the world to take over control of the world. So they, it's this anti-Semitic thing rose up during the plague. But you know what was actually going on? The Jews were following kosher laws. They were following kosher laws. They were washing, they were cleansing, they were separating themselves. Everything that it says in Leviticus to do when there's, uh, when there's a disease or concerning dealing with our food or dealing with all of those things, they were living kosher. They were, they were living kosher. So the reason that the blessing of God was on them is because they were living kosher. They, they were doing all of the things that prevented the spread of disease amongst uh, people and amongst community because God had given them the revelation, this wonderful revelation of how to stay out of that, how to stay clean, how to be healthy. You know what I mean? Because a lot of the uh, Levitical laws are really interesting because it covers several areas. Some of it is to do with the priesthood and um, some of it is to do with, um, I, I suppose you could call it sanitation, but I, I hate some of those terminology because the reason I hate it is because we always want to pull God down into the natural. We always want to pull it down um, into our natural understanding. Um, look, I, 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 I believe and I pray that God, you know, like when I go to bed, I want dreams. I want God to speak to me in the night. I want to be heading down here into the cafe for lunch, waiting for them to heat up my cheese and onion toasty sandwich fall into a trance, see a vision, a big sheet drop down. That's what I want. I'm not a, I, I, what you've got to understand is, is, is when you get into the things of the Spirit, you want the things of the Spirit. You don't want to just be limited to someone that's constantly, constantly got your nose stuck down in the Bible, just word, 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 word. Because Christianity is, an, is experiential. Like, I'm not walking with Christ today because I understand the Word. I'm walking with Christ today because in the middle of an LSD trip in 1975, God broke into my life, made me sober, started speaking to me, just started speaking to me. And what He told me to do, I just did it. I just started doing what He said. That was it. It was, the whole thing was, it was a supernatural experience that radically, my life, I was more surprised than anybody about the change in my life. Stuff just started, everything that I'd longed for and wanted to do before that was all just changing on the inside. And I go down like I'm only saved for about three or four days and I go down to this big job in the hotel in Wellington and we'd, we'd had this, um, it was shag pole carpet, the old 70s, you know, shag pole carpet in the 70s and it was chocolate brown and, and sort of a creamy white. And this architect got this idea about this lounge bar in the hotel that it was, he had this whole, hearing bone design thing going on and he wanted the carpet all cut up. In those days we didn't have those heat irons to join it. Everything was hand sewn. And 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 I had the I had the job of putting together his vision and we chopped all of this carpet up. It wasn't the bar was probably as big as this one section here. And the carpet was copped, all chopped up into strips about that long and then put out in a pattern with the chocolate brown thing and hand sewn together, and then hand glued, then turned over, you had to turn it upside down to hand sew it. We had these things with a, you have a leather thing with a thing to push the needles through because the carpet was really hard and you push the needles through that, pull it out the other side. I mean, your hands were all gnarly and calluses and that all over them and we sewed it all together, turned it upside, stretched it down, laid it, tacks in the mouth, magnetic hammer, terrible those things that stick into your gums it was, they tasted revolting but anyway and uh and the architect comes to me and he says hey go out there in the stu stairway there's a bag out there and it's just full of drugs just take whatever you want well if he had have said that to me like five days before I never would have left the staircase <laughs> I'd still be there now working my way through that bag of dope you know what I mean I seen I was so into it I was just into the drugs in such a big way man you wouldn't have got me off the staircase I'd still be going you know off my face but I stood there and write him because I just had this encounter with the Lord and I said to him listen mate I'm a Christian now I don't need that junk anymore I don't want it you know you can keep your drugs I don't need that you know that boldness that pops up out even the Holy Ghost you don't even know why you're afterwards you're going away sort of regretting it thinking oh well I could have probably 
just had a couple of, he could have kept a couple of little ones, you know, surely God wouldn't mind that. But at the moment, you'd already, you'd already opened your big fat trap and said that you're a born again Christian and I don't need that junk anymore. So it's pretty hard to retract from that position and to scarper out and sneak into the bag and get a few goodies out. See, we never, you never want to lose that. You never want to lose that spontaneous movement of the Holy Spirit on your life. See, you know, Christians, sometimes Christians get miserable. You know, they're just miserable people because they've lost the spontaneity of the Spirit out of their life, the Holy Ghost. The, they've lost the excitement. They've lost the enthusiasm. Um, just get sucked out of them because, um, yeah, we, we're susceptible to deception. That's our problem. The deception comes in and the life sucks out. And... Um, but it's, there's, just, there's just so much so much better. I had a couple of emails this week, which I really enjoy because I had several people write in and I, talk, I mentioned just in passing about um, verses in the Bible with parentheses and how things are added in. And the, the thing about what I appreciated about the emails that came to me was the spirit of it. Uh, there was not a judgmental spirit. It wasn't critical. It wasn't even a disagreement. It was just asking um, a little bit more of explanation about that. And the thing about it, if you do understand um, uh, understand that, what they've done in the Greek, sometimes going from the Greek to the English, there's a, there's a, it's a little bit difficult to explain exactly what it, the Greek means in the English. And so when they do the interpretation, they may add something to help us understand it a little bit better. Some of those things in parentheses are very accurate with the Greek, but some of them are not. Some of, them, some of them actually carry bias. And um, because what, <laughs> whenever man gets his paw into the revelation of God, you're always going to have somewhat of a mixture in there. You know, like I'm a preacher, you're going to get somewhat of a mixture in here. You need, you need to understand that. Not everything I say is perfect. I'm not a perfect person. There's somewhat of a mixture. But see, what I'm relying on is the Holy Ghost in you going, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and when he goes, you, what should happen then is you, you should take note and you go back into the Scripture. You go back into the Scripture and you study the Scripture and you, you, it, might, it might just remain a, <laughs> but it shouldn't, it shouldn't upset you or remove you or cause you to break fellowship or anything like that. It sits there and you should, all of us should at, at all times have an open mind because if God wants to take that eh away and make it a yes and an amen, we've got to be prepared for God to do that. We've, 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 we've got to be prepared because we're all at different places in our journey. You know what I mean? And, and what I'm seeing, you may not be seeing at this time. Um, and what you're seeing, I may not be seeing at this time. Uh, so, but it was, it, it's, it's, in, it's quite encouraging. But that's why... That's why don't follow Luther. Don't, follow, don't be a reformist and follow Martin Luther. Uh, Kerry and I were talking a little bit about it the other day, but at the, towards the end of Martin Luther's life, he became anti-Semitic. He hated the Jews. Martin Luther was a German. So when Hitler comes along, the church is already anti-Semitic because of their reformer, their great reforming leader that nailed his theses on the door of the Catholic church justification through faith and he nails this treaty up and the revelation come, people start getting born again, amazing. But at the same time, he developed a, a negative attitude towards Israel and caused the Jewish people, well, that's not God. You know, so you've got to spit, you've got to spit the pips out. But we have a responsibility in God, each one of us, to be led by the Holy Spirit and not to be shallow, and I don't mean this, but, but to go back into the Word and we study the Word out until we get a resolution like... That, that tape that Kelly um, had, had just mentioned to me, I was so enjoying it. I just, I probably, other than that one statement that he made, I enjoyed everything he said. And, but when the one statement made, I knew, see, because what happened, I knew at that point he just dumped a whole lot of stuff together. He just gave a proof text that didn't even relate to what he was talking about. Food, food wasn't the issue in Acts chapter 10. The issue was, was Peter going to minister to the Gentiles who he believed were unclean. And God's saying, don't you call unclean what I call clean. If I've worked on their lives and, you know, they're going to get saved, they're coming to me, don't you call them unclean. But he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, um, 
he didn't actually then include, he didn't then include all the other food items from Leviticus and say, now that's all suddenly clean, tuck in. You know, eat crow, eat eagle, eat it all, get in there. Tuck it. See, doesn't, see, that doesn't say that. And when you go through the scriptures and you study it, you, you go back and, you, you know, when you get that thing in your spirit and you go back and you study it, you go back with an open mind, you go back into the Greek, you look at the different virgin, uh, virgins, you look at the ten virgins, and you're looking for the virgins that have oil. That was a day of saving myself here, aren't I? I'm the, because, because you don't want to listen to people who don't have oil. That's why I've said to you over and over again, don't listen to ministry that are not filled with the Holy Ghost, loving the Holy Ghost, supportive of the Holy Ghost, encouraging the move of the Holy Spirit, the freedom of the Holy Spirit. I mean, how many times do I have to hit you on the head with it? Why would you keep going there, putting yourself under that Spirit? It's, it's always going to have, a, it's always going to create a revelatory limitation it doesn't matter how clever they are at teaching and how much greek in that they expound it's still go, it's still not going to come with the spirit the spirit life on it and i want to tell you see see what we don't understand about the law okay let me let me fast forward you now we're in the new covenant and um jesus starts talking about the law <clears throat> i actually if you give me a choice um, and uh, you give me a choice, do I want to follow the Ten Commandments or the law as I understand it, the law given by Christ Jesus in the New Covenant? Give me the Ten Commandments any day. Thou shalt not murder, I'm not killing anybody. Thou shalt not commit adultery, I'm not committing adultery with anybody. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, honour your father and mother. Um, da, 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 da. This is easy peasy. You know what I mean? That's why the rich young ruler came to Jesus and Jesus said, talked to him about the law he said I've kept the whole law ever since I was a youth so then then what does Jesus do to the rich hunger he challenges them with something that's spiritual sell everything you have and give all your money to the poor hey hold it hold it Jesus you're getting a bit carried away now you know you, you're getting you know my he's obviously came from a wealthy family it sounded like he was a young man in the story hey hey you know don't touch the money brother um so now the reason I say give me the Ten Commandments because that's easy peasy because Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6 and chapter 7 and I want to say this in this. Paul is great, Peter's great, James is great, Timothy's great, um, Titus is great but there's no one like the Son of God. There's no one like Jesus. There's no one who is the living word. There's no one, not one of those men who wrote the New Testament, not one of them is comparable to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It talks about in the scripture, you can look it up yourself. I've got it there, but I won't bother. Um, it talks about the doctrines of Christ. And see, when I read the Bible and I start looking at what Jesus taught, to me, it has a higher value because he's, he's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Meter. He's the creator. He's the God man. He's the perfect one. Everyone else, like Paul in his own testimony, he was persecuting the Jews or the, sorry, the Gentiles. He was persecuting um, uh, the Gentiles and killing them. He was a great man. He was a, a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was brilliant. No doubt about that. But compared to Jesus, nah. So, so when you get, over into the, you get over into Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7, it's probably the most comprehensive teaching of Jesus Christ to his disciples that's recorded clearly in the Bible. You've got three whole chapters of red letter all the way in there. And what does he, what does he start saying? He's talking now about the new covenant, and he's talking about, if, if you don't understand, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And he says, if a man looks at a woman with lust he's already committed adultery well give me the ten commandments i don't want to be i don't want to be judged by a higher standard i don't want to be judged by that standard i want to be i want to be judged by the ten commandments standard where i haven't been with anybody committing adultery i don't want to be judged by the jesus this is the see what we don't understand see we are the the lawless ones the gentiles oppose the law 
the Judaism exalt the law. Jesus, what, what you've got to understand, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is above the law. So where the law, if you commit adultery with a woman, there was a judgment that came on your God. Now, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is that if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've hit someone, you've already murdered them. What? <laughs> Don't fight over the Levit Levitical law. Now, <coughs> do you realize, um, do you realize in this, in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, do you realize what's going on here now? Do you realize that that law, that level of law, and I could read to you five, six, and seven, I could go through all of, there's a whole list of them in there. And this is Jesus, this is red letter. This is Jesus stuff coming. Do you realize how unobtainable that is? <laughs> We're judged, they, they were judged, if they were going to follow the old law, they had to keep all of the law, otherwise they came under the judgment of God. There was not one part of the law they could think, that's fine. This level of law, do you realize how unobtainable that is? <laughs> think about it. It's unobtainable. Except, except, this is why we've got to move on from Jesus who made us righteous to the new covenant and the power of the Holy Spirit that can cause us to be victorious. Yeah. It's not just faith in Jesus alone to be reconciled to God, to be made righteous. Now that we're made righteous, there's this new covenant that is being revealed right out before. This is the covenant I want you to walk in. It's the, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the dictates of the flesh. So where's your dependency? Your dependency in Christ for righteousness, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, it's very, very clear, and now in the Holy Ghost for victory. The only place, see, you, you will not be able to keep the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus without the Holy Ghost. See, it's, so if you, if, if people are, people around the world, around the, a lot of them are in churches that do not believe in the baptism, the fullness, the gifts, the power of the Holy Spirit. They're not spirit-filled believers. How on earth? You haven't got a hope in hell of fulfilling the law, the spirit of the law in Christ Jesus. You, you haven't got a hope in hell of fulfilling what Jesus called, called, he added to, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. We don't know how to pray, but what the Spirit of God within us with groanings and utterings that we don't understand, he prays on our behalf. You can't live without the Holy Ghost. You won't survive without the Holy Ghost. You won't make it without the Holy Ghost. You will not have the courage without the Holy Ghost. You won't have the boldness without him. You won't have the miracles without him. You don't work the miracles. It's the Spirit of God that's the power of God manifests. If he chooses through someone in life, he moves and manifests and the healing and the deliverance comes through him. See, you've got to, again, again, we've got to change our attitude. We've got to have an open mind to these things. Um, Jesus said, I must go, because <laughs> he had to go because he knew, he knew we would not be able to keep the new standard without the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. He had to go because he had to send someone, the comforter, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside, the enabler, the divine power, the seal of God, the indwelling presence of God himself to not only enable you to make it to heaven, but to overcome, to triumph over the enemy. And, and I, I don't think we triumph on day one. I, don't, I, I think, it, I think the, the triumphant march of the spirit-filled Christian is this ongoing, progressive, victorious march. You, you trip, you get back up, gone. the scripture addresses that, you get back up again. The, you know, the worst thing you do is lay down. The, the other thing as I see in the body is, is people get... Um, um, this thing of the closed mind, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address this. I'm preaching in the Spirit tonight. I'm, I'm talking to you guys. You're lucky enough to be here, but I'm attacking things up there. 
the promise of the new covenant was that God would do what? Write the law in your heart and your mind. So the tablets of stone are left there <coughs> and now the Spirit of God writes his law in the heart and in the mind. So what I do in Bible study, like when I'm, when I'm studying, so God just starts speaking to me and then I thought, yeah, 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 the law of God on the heart and mind. What does it say about the heart? So what I do, what I often do is I, this is this, is this morning, so this is my daily bread, this is my devotions this morning that you're getting here um, with a few illustrations from Sunday morning. So you've got some leftovers and you've got some, you got some mana, all right? Mana is the bread that you pick up on the day, the revelation of the day, and leftovers is what you got on Sunday that you're still eating on Wednesday night. But sometimes you break them up into a fritter, they taste pretty good. But um, so, so then this law that's written on our hearts and our mind, and for some reason I got stuck on the area of the heart, and, and so I, I, I just go in and I, and I do a search in my Bible program, and I just look up all the scriptures relating to heart. Talks about the heart more in the New Testament than it does in the Old Testament, which is interesting, but Matthew 15, 18. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts and murder. Well, isn't that interesting? If the law of God is written in your heart, what, what's, why is that stuff coming out? Anyway, James 1.26, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. It's interesting, isn't it? Matthew 12.34-36, to you brood of vipers, not you, you lovely people, you're all beloved of the Lord. How can you speak good when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of the judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For out of the heart, um, Luke 6.45, <coughs> this, is, this is a repeat of Matthew 12. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks uh, Hebrews 4:12. for the word of God is living and active you've heard this verse haven't you sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart the law of God the prophecy the law of God is written in your heart and in your mind 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honour Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and with respect. So, <clears throat> I mean, I've got a lot of other verses, you could go through lots and lots of verses. So I, wanna, I just wanna, I want you to understand that the, 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 the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is a higher standard of law than Leviticus. Now, um, uh, Dave's a pilot, he, he will know this, he'll understand this, but um, on the earth the reason that we have our feet on the ground is because the law of gravity. And so, you know, I don't understand, the earth spins around and everything, there's this gravity force that comes down that presses everything that's matter, it gets presses down to the centre of the earth. So if I get up on, <coughs> on the step one as much as I'd like to fly, gravity kicks in. So how does a plane get off the ground? The plane gets off the ground because the wings are arched like this and it's the law of lift. And so when the wings are arched like this and the, the, the plane is propelled down, what actually happens, it causes a suction. So a, a plane's not pushed up off the earth, it's sucked up off the earth by the law, the law of lift. See, the law of lift, when you put speed to it, is greater than the law of gravity. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is a greater law than the Mosaic law. That's why the difference between 
actually committing adultery in the Mosaic law is now lifted to a new standard. And the new standard is if you lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. If you hate someone, you've already murdered them. You see? Do you understand? So what the Lord, what the Lord does, the Lord overrides the law. He doesn't, Jesus came to fulfill it. He didn't come to remove it. He came to fulfill it. And what he did is he overrode the law with a greater law, the law of the spirit of life. And then he says, see, a lot of it, it takes a lot of searching out to really get the understanding. Then he says things, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the dictates of the flesh. So I want to, you know, the challenges for us now is to be walking in the Holy Ghost. And, and what I've discovered, and you can agree or disagree, what I've discovered is the more I understand of the scripture, the more I study and the washing of the word takes place in my life, the more I'm able to walk in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And then, then what happens when you're walking in the spirit of life, when you're, when you're, when you're not fulfilling the dictates of the flesh, you know, you're not, you're not living back there any longer. You're not living there. You're walking in the Holy Ghost. And then when you're in that spirit realm, anything can happen. Anything can happen. You're, in, you're, you're, actually, you're actually in the spirit. It's like I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You're actually in the spirit realm. And um, I, I really want to really uh, encourage you because um, I, I, want, I want you to understand I want you to understand the Scripture and the power of the Scripture and the revelation, the understanding of Scripture, but I never want you to do it to the expense of experiencing the power of the Holy Ghost on your life. It's not an either-or thing. You don't have to, it's not an either-or, it's a both-and. It's meant to be both-and. Um, see, like, uh, I know at the moment I'm... I'm hanging around with a lot of apostolic ministry in the nation. Most of them are Holy Spirit ministry. They've got a real focus because what ha what's happening in the church in New Zealand is, um, and around the world is the church has got pretty carnal and woke. And the, I mean, you don't have to, if you want to find the world, just go to church. But um, anyway, <coughs> I'm being facetious, but that's, hey, I'm not quite perfect. Take it or leave it. Thank you, Lorraine. I'll take it you leaving it. <laughs> they're not uh, if you're not in the spirit if they're not in the if you're not recognizing the holy spirit what i want you to understand is all the way through the bible let me get with this piece of paper because this this i wrote things down just while you were worshiping i was talking to god you were singing to him and because every time i come in here you know, and the worship's going on what i find in the anointing see when the anointing the holy spirit's here in the anointing it, the, the heavens are open, the voice of God. See, while I'm preaching to you about this, God could be talking to you about something completely different. That's how it works. Because, because what God might want to say to you on this Wednesday night may not be the message that I'm bringing. But if there's any anointing on the message I'm bringing, God will be speaking to you about what he wants to talk to you about. That's the life of the Spirit. He applies to you what you need. I mean, God's awesome. God's awesome. But I wrote this down. Moses had his burning bush. Abraham had, had his promised son when he was 100 year old. Jacob wrestled with the angel. And uh, a lot of, when you go back and study that, a lot of people believe that he was wrestling with Christ. And why did Jacob get the promise of Israel? Some of these things you study. Why, did, why was Jacob's name changed to Israel and and why was the covenant that God made with Israel so important? Because Jacob wrestled. Let's say just it was the angel of the Lord. He wasn't going to let the angel of the Lord go until he got blessing. So what does that show us? He had a deep hunger and desire to encounter the supernatural. There's this ladder and everything goes on. He sees up into the heavens. There's angels ascending and descending. And here's, here's Jacob, the deceiver, laying hold. No, I won't let you go until you bless me. So you had this passionate hunger for the miraculous. You're not getting out of here. It says the angel touched his hip. He had a limp from that time on because he would, he'd wrestle with God. That's, that's why we are passionately in love with Jesus. I, oh. And emotionally in love with Jesus. It's not noodle. Heart. 
Joseph had his dreams. Don't you love that? All of his family were upset about it. David had his mighty victories. You know, when God went before him, he had all those victories. And David was incredible. David's attitude towards Saul, who was trying to kill him and everything, <laughs> was phenomenal. But I love, I love David. I wish I could play a guitar and sing. David, could, he had everything, that guy. He killed the giant. He killed lions. He sang songs. He wrote hymns. He, he honored his leader when his leader was wicked. He, I mean, that guy, he was something else. Um, Saul was thrown to the ground and struck blind. <laughs> That's a cool encounter for someone persecuting the church, eh? Like, God goes like this, whack, he's out. Not only is he down, here's this guy who's the Pharisee of the Pharisees, the brightest of the brightest, with all this great, great knowledge. What, what does God say? You're blind, mate. You're blind, mate. Mate's a God term. <laughs> says, have a read of John's book of Revelation about the church in there. They thought, you know, they were rich and they had all of these things, but they were naked, poor and blind. That's you, Paul. But he gets up and the Lord commissions. Isn't that beautiful? Um, Isaiah. Oh. Think about that. Here he is. He saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the whole temple. And instantly he's convicted. And he says, and he see Isaiah is a prophet called to what? Be a mouthpiece of God. And he says, God, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. And the Lord sent the seraphim, imagine this, with tongs, not to put your drumsticks on your plate and your roast potatoes that the missus, you got your tongs. He gets the tongs, he brings a coal off the altar of God and comes and touches his lips and cleanses his lip. That's miraculous stuff. This is supernatural stuff. I love this stuff. I want tongs. <laughs> Mary, an innocent Young lady that God had chosen is going to miraculously conceive um, the God man, the Savior. You'll call his name Jesus. <laughs> it's phenomenal. It, it's just God. Um, the dead are raised, the blind see, the deaf hear, the cripples walk, the lepers are healed. Just goes on and on. And what I, I just want to encourage you is. Don't um, just stay open to the Holy Ghost. Um, for me, my life, my walk with God has been punctuated by Holy Ghost experiences. I'd like to organize more, but they seem to come when God decides, not when I decide. But every single time that I've been overcome by the presence of God, it's changed my life radically. Now, it probably didn't do anything to yours but it certainly did something to me. See? So when the Holy Ghost turns up into your life and he kicks down the doors, the blockages in the mind and the preconceived ideas and all that, and he gives a little boot and he comes on in, and you have, whether it's a dream or a revelation or you drop into a trance or God comes or you're shaking and baking or you're weeping and weeping, you don't know why, and the Holy Spirit of God is actually moving on your life. He's changing you. He's not, if he's falling on you, he's changing you. He's not changing me. He's changing you radically. That uh, meeting when, on, when with the last conference and Nancy preached on the Sunday morning, and I just, I haven't been, I just got so drunk in the Spirit. When I looked back and I saw, um, you know, I wanted that edited before it went online because I knew I was going to look like a complete idiot. And I wanted to try and edit out the idiot. <laughs> but anyway, it went up, up she goes, you know, thank you guys. And there's the idiot up there falling all over the place and heavy breathing and struggling to stand up and everything. But I, will, I was, I mean, I don't know about you, but I was having an incredibly powerful encounter with God. I just, after that, I just came out. I couldn't explain it all, but I felt different. But I also felt... In that particular experience, that time, the power of God, for whatever reason God chose, was flowing through me, was also touching the lives of other people. Something was happening to them. Something was happening to people in the spirit. Um, look, I, 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 um, I just want to encourage you, don't limit, don't limit God. 
have everything. Have everything. Like when we get up to that marriage supper of the lamb, eat everything that's on the table. Have a crack at everything that's offered up there. Everything. You know what I mean? Don't be picky. Don't be a picky. Don't be a picky. Have everything. Don't be, don't, don't have a selective type of Christianity. That's why, I, I, you know, often when I'm going to sleep at night and I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be asleep. I'm going to be dreaming. Talk to me. Cut through, cut through my natural man and speak to my spiritual man. Do something to me. Look, there's revival. I'll tell you what, there's revival is here. Um, the spirit of revival is here. And if you're picking up on what's happening, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's here. It's actually, look, God can, oh, your life could be so incredibly exciting um, being led by the Holy Spirit of God. I, I, I really, how do I do it? How do I start a fire in you? How do I create an appetite in you for the things of the Spirit of God? Um, I want you to have an appetite for the Word. I want you, when, when something goes eh in your spirit, go back into the Word and study it out. But with an open mind, not a critical, not a critical mind. Um, <laughs> don't follow the men of God. Here we go. Follow the God of men. Paul said, what it was it Peter or Paul? He said, follow me as I follow Jesus. What he was meaning is, I'm following Jesus, you follow Jesus too. That, that's, what I want in this, that's what I want from you in the church. I want to hear about your Holy Ghost-led spiritual adventures in God. That's all I'm asking as a, as a leader of the church. I just want to hear about how God... And some of, the, some of the things that God does in our lives are almost mundane, but they're miraculous, just the same. God, the little miracles. You know, the... When you wake up and the Lord might just say, I love you. You know, but that few words that he breathes into your life is what you needed to hear so much. You needed to know that there was someone out there that loves you. Somewhere out there in the world, somebody loves me. I always feel, whenever I say something like that, I always feel like he's putting up his hand going, oh, I love you, you know. And you 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 and you. I've got enough love, God says, to go around to every single one of you. But this, or I, for want of a better, better word, <laughs> I was going to, because I thought it would be a bit controversial, I was going to call it kosher Christianity, but I know. I know. <laughs> 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 but I'm at the moment, I'm, it's sort of the same thing, I'm calling it organic Christianity, where, where the people of God are led by the Spirit of God. And um, it's, it's not confining, it's freeing. It's freeing. And I'm going to close with that. You know, they, there's a story, you know, they talk about a flea and you catch a flea and you put him in a jar and you put the lid on the jar and the flea jumps up and bangs his, lid, bangs his head on the lid. Bang, 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 bang. Then you take the lid off and the flea's learnt only to jump that high and he doesn't jump. And that's what happens to us in the, if we're not careful in the church is because we close our minds and our hearts to the greater things that God has, when God says jump, we only jump so high. We, we just constantly hit him. It's interesting that it's the head that hits and stops us going any further because sometimes I think this thing on the top of our shoulders is an enemy. <laughs> it's, an, it's an enemy. And I think we, we have to deliberately say, Holy Spirit, um, create in me a new mind. Transform my mind. Renew my mind. Renew my thinking because I just want to go further. I want to fly higher. I want to, I want to see more. I want to see more of you. So let's just stand together. And um, Father, I just thank you, Heavenly Father, so much for your word, for your truth. I thank you for, um, for the truth that's been there before, <laughs> that, that um, the truth that pre-existed a lot of the covenants, that truth that you revealed that pre-existed everything and we just are picking up on that truth. Thousands of years later, we're beginning to see the truth that you revealed way back in the beginning to us. But Father, I just pray for each one in this house tonight. And Holy Spirit, I just, I just pray, Holy Spirit, for a fresh anointing on each person. I ask, Lord, that you'd remove any of the obstacles out of our mind. 
remove any of the hardness out of our heart. I ask, Lord, that you would create in us a new heart and a new mind and a new spirit and that the heart of stone would be removed and the heart of flesh would replace it. I pray, Lord, that you would lift us up into that realm where we need to be totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit, where we need to be walking in the Spirit, dependent on the Spirit and living in the Spirit. And Father, I just pray your richest blessing over each one. And Lord, I know, I know, Lord, there's going to be souls saved, bodies healed, eyes open, deaf ears open, cripples walking. Father, I just know as your word penetrates into each part of our heart and life that the miraculous power of Almighty God is going to be manifest in, around, upon us and through us. And Father, we just give you praise for that. Father, I just bless this house. I bless Israel tonight. I bless your people. I bless Israel. I bless the work of your hands. I bless the nation. I bless what you're doing there. I decree peace, peace and salvation um, to your people, those people that you chose to work through for all of these thousands of years. Let your blessing rest upon them in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right, give the Lord a hand and go home. Be blessed. Be blessed.